Welcome to Influence, the podcast that dives deep into the heart of influencer marketing and the creator economy with the people who know it best, the agents, creators, and marketers who operate behind the scenes. This podcast is hosted by Powder, where streamers can search their best moments to find short, shareable stream clips with AI. And I'm your host, Alyssa Goldberg. We've got a really fascinating episode ahead of us today, since we're welcoming Louis George Stringer, who has played a meaningful part in the way that chess is marketed and consumed online. By harnessing the power of influencer marketing and content creation in gaming, he has found the perfect alchemy of turning chess and its most talented players into huge channels with millions of views. He's worked with Magnus Carlsen, the world's number one chess player, and helped him and his companies build a fan base along with Alexandra Botez and the world's number one chess YouTuber, Gotham Chess, along with Chess.com. Chess may sound niche, but it's a multi-billion dollar industry now played by 10% of the world's population and much of its popularity driven by live streaming on Twitch and YouTube. So needless to say, we are so excited to have Louis here today to help us understand influencer marketing and the creator economy through the lens of chess. Welcome, welcome. Happy to have you here on Influence. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I, I, we, re we reached out on LinkedIn right a while back and connected. Yeah. And I'm a user of Powder, actually. I've used it a few times. Oh, so, cool. Yes, yeah, uh, pleasure to be here. Well, that's an even, uh, that's a nice added bonus. It's wonderful to, to have you here. Um, and I know that when we first spoke, because we had a little introductory call after we chatted on LinkedIn, you were telling me that you kind of first got started in working with chess streamers or working with chess players and helping them create their content online because you were doing it yourself. You were a chess player, you had made a video that went viral. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that first chess video? What about it worked so well? And then how you got connected with the chess community uh, more broadly? Of course, yeah, so in so many industries, you know, you get sort of like video editors, directors, producers, like a, a wide array of cast, I suppose, that back up the talent quite often initially when an audience is quite small like chess is very niche you're going to have people that are you know chess players themselves actually supporting the production um, this is typically the case in industries where it's like very big let's say we're looking at something like banking or something you're not going to get like a startup banker you know so like this it just doesn't exist um, but in the startup sort of space in terms of influencer marketing especially in chess or if in a small niche typically the guys producing the show are also fans of the show so you kind of get this big overlap so I, I guess that's totally. how i initially got into it so the youtube channel pretty cool so started this out where i was basically just editing uh people's streams so i'd watch people's streams mm. watch them do a broadcast and then i just find like the fun moments stuff that i personally found enjoyable and then i would just cut it together in like compilation basically and just upload it to youtube uh so this was my first video i ended up getting around two million views uh when i first started uh, which is really huge uh, for chess, this sort of is really niche thing. And I guess I kind of set my career on this six year course where I've went from being a very sort of behind the computer, nobody guy who's just sort of playing chess into someone who's quite relevant in the sort of, uh, you know, influencer sphere. Yeah. And when you're, when you were creating compilations like that for chess, um, can, can you explain to me, like, I don't know, a few details about how you optimize those like how long typically were those compilations what what made you find or like what were the best moments to you how would you kind of frame them in terms of captions and thumbnails and things like that i think lots of people who listen to the podcast are creators or work with creators and um you know care care about those details because that's what works yeah i guess it, it like there's this big question on youtube which has always been around like do you want to do short form content as like per episode like part one part two or do you go for something with really long form mm. i've been on both ends so i've produced content that's been incredibly viral there's like 10 second content which is just one sort of game and then the completely other end is sort of these multi long hour videos i actually started my career with my first video, I think being over an hour long. So it's like really, really long, uh, which is quite rare these days. So it's, it's sort yeah. of rare to see that sort of long uh, format. Um, but I really enjoyed it because you can kind of binge watch. So it's like, if someone likes 30 seconds, you know, and they like one minute and they like two minutes, then why can't they like two hours of it, right? Like if you, if you get involved, you might as well go through the whole thing. So I, I see this kind of being split today, honestly, because some creators are still going 
of really long format, other, other people going really short. I'd say that if you want to know which you prefer, like you might say, oh, I prefer long form content. But if you go to your YouTube and all of your recommended videos are short form content, then you're actually kind of <laughs> lying to yourself, right? Like, and it's the yeah, same way YouTube that YouTube knows. Are, it knows <laughs> yeah. it so well, right? It's like knows everything. So yeah, so I, I guess I, I've been on both sides of a battle. I've enjoyed the long form content and the short form and everything in the middle um, and also live production as well. And I guess the, the trick is always, you know, you have a content, you have a piece of, uh, of content you want to produce, whether you're the talent or whether you're the person working with a talent and you have to think, okay, how does this work? You know, is this going to get viral in a five second video? Is this something you want to do an hour on? Um, is it something you can do both, right? Sometimes you can have a long piece of content and then repurpose something smaller. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of ways of cutting the pie depending of who you are. Yeah, and do you find that, okay, so I feel like chess is a really interesting segment. It's kind of gaming, it's kind of not gaming, but it's using the same channels and same kind of approaches as gaming content creation to spread the word and also to showcase the skills of, uh, of the players. How do you see the relationship between like what works in chess streaming versus kind of what works and what the trends are in gaming content creation? Yeah, it's a, it's a weird overlap, right? So if you imagine like a Venn diagram, which is so yeah. nerdy, right? Like who mentions Venn no, diagrams? No, no, no. But like, yeah, if you, if you have one and you think of like entertainment, education, sort of gaming, um, it, it kind of falls into this weird subsector mm. of all of them, even if it was sports, right? So it's like, is chess a sport or not? Right. So I'd say that like, depending on the creator in the chess world, people take it from different angles, right? And you can have this in any kind of interest. So you could have it with with any kind of sport. Let's say like uh, an another parallel is a like UFC, right? So you've got like cage fighting and stuff like this. Some people watch it as a sport, other people watch it as entertainment, mm. other people watch it as education or as a philosophy, right? Like the, the technique be, uh, with the fighting. So I'd say that in the chess industry, like any other industry, you will find that kind of person who's interested in all those different things. And quite often when I'm working behind the scenes in, in a company, I'm trying to break down like, okay, which audience is this targeting? Is it targeting the, the, the watchers that just want to mm. like have fun? Is it targeting the people that are more engaged? So for instance, they want to play chess and they want to watch, or do they want to learn and they want to play? You know, what kind of combination uh, are they reaching? Um, and this, of course, goes uh, age demographic, demographics and also skill. So people who are really bad mm. at chess generally just want the entertainment. Uh, people that are very good typically like want the education. So it, like... It's, it depends uh, very much on the situation. That's fascinating. I, 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 it didn't really occur to me, although it probably should, just because um, in chess there is a huge difference between being like a, a novice chess player uh, and a super, super master um, and what kind of content you would like to create. I guess in, in gaming that's sometimes true, but not always. Like, you know, lots of people, whether you're bad or good, you might find ninja really entertaining uh, uh for Fortnite. yeah i think this is a key to really good game design to be honest because you need something that's like uh deep enough for someone to stare into the game for a long time and find new things right mm. new techniques new strategies but then for it to be simple enough that the novice can pick up the game and just understand mm. it right in intuitively and, and be able to uh, play so it's kind of like having those two things together is the most rewarding Typically, yeah. if you listen to like a beginner chess player talk, it's kind of like, oh, you know, the, the horsey has gone here, or something, the knight's gone there, and this is being attacked and like really basic level. And if you're speaking to someone who's a grandmaster, it's like a completely different league. Like it's almost like they're on a multi-step dream, you know, like the movie Inception, right? Like they're like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like 50 dreams down into the state, right? So they're looking in <laughs> things that don't even make sense to the normal person. And typically like, the, the main difference is, is that beginner chess players talk about what they see, advanced chess players talk about what they don't see, which is uh, really weird. So it's almost like this backwards way of viewing it, right? It's like if you're looking at what happened versus if you're looking at the possibilities of what could happen. And it's like this, uh, this difference in perspective. And quite often, even this has reflections in everywhere in life and philosophy. And you can even have it in content production, right? So it matters in editing what you choose to show and what you leave on the cutting board. So it sort of yeah. has this like um, chess has always lessons hidden inside of it that seem only relevant to chess, but when you drag it out, it actually 
makes a lot of sense in in any sphere. So I found lots of interesting parallels between the production of content creation and the actual sport itself, which is quite fun. So, so interesting. And do you find, so you've worked with both independent creators and then also with companies. Um, what do you think is the difference, at least in the chess streaming ecosystem of working with these two different kinds of channels uh, and how, how have you shaped your approaches to each one? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's like, typically you have an individual, right? Who's almost a company in their own right. So they have like yep. a, you know, they have their own needs. Um, quite often they have like accounting, you know, they have like marketing, yeah. they have content production. So when you're dealing with a company, you're, you're also dealing with like a big person. You could view it that way. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, you know, it's either like a company, you know, condensed into a person or a person <laughs> stretched into a company, right? Yeah. And so typically if you're thinking about like tone of voice for a company, you know, you're, you're looking at something really uh, li large scale compared to small scale. So in terms of mindset, you have to be professionally cons consistent to some degree, depending whether you're dealing with a corporation, you know, you're freelancing or you're yeah. employed somewhere uh, to make a piece of content, or you're working one-on-one -on -one with an influencer. Quite often when you're working between the influencer and the company, you just have to be a translator, you know, similar to, mm. you know, translating English to to, to Spanish, um, in some ways, it's almost like translating British English to American English, because they're both speaking the same language, but they can't communicate, right? The influencer <laughs> yeah. and the company, you know, have these things where it's like, you know, the, the CEO might describe a video and he's like, well, I really wanted to hit these demographics. I really wanted to, you know, feel this way. It's really got to hit this next target. And the influencers are okay, that's cool. But how do I actually translate that into an actionable, creative point? Right. Right. So, you know, being that intersection between the two, you have to like work with uh, the difficult people, you know, who, actually it depends who the difficult people are, right? Like typically the difficult people are the companies in, in my yeah. view, maybe other people find the individuals difficult to deal mm. with. Um, but yeah, so my approach is more or less the same. Um, it, it mostly comes down to like difference of budget, difference of scale, difference of personality. Um, there's very different check marks that I'm going through when dealing with a company. Mm. Typically with a company, it's all business. You want to, you're, you're talking very technically with an individual, quite often the expectations are very different, even in terms of how much you're getting paid. Um, quite often you're just looking to, to do something for passion or for the right. namesake, right? Your name being associated with that person or the project. So for instance, it's been a huge boost in my career, having worked with Magnus uh, personally um, compared to, working with corporations or banks that might have more money or more influence, you know, in some kind of like technical sense, but lack the creative output that Magnus has. So it's like this weird flex between the two. So complicated answer. But that's, that's yeah, no, 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 it, it makes perfect sense. And, and I was going to ask about um, the management of different personalities. So thank you for uh, preempting that. Um, but I feel like chess is also really interesting in that a lot of players, I guess, I, in some ways, because chess has traditionally been an analog game, obviously there's been massive growth in the digital and streaming space, but how much pressure do you feel like there is for a chess player to double as a content creator? I'd say huge pressure, huge, mm. because chess in itself has not been supported by the government in many places. Mm. And so we think about like, this goes into the role of like, you know, to, to what degree does the government have to support their uh their influencers right right like um in in the same way versus a company has to support an ecosystem of influencers underneath it in content creation and this is a really difficult question because if a company quite often can't afford to support multiple content creators they can't give him a salary you know what i mean it's not possible mm. they might hire a few internal content creators um, but it's very difficult so in terms of like chess's position in the world I think there's a huge pressure because the government are there to support people in many countries. Uh, the person has to become a content creator in order to monetize mm. themselves. So it's this big um, difference in, in Russia, typically um, for, for a very long time, Russia supported chess as a, as a sport. Right. So typically they get salaries, uh, which is Ooh. really, uh, which is really strange uh, yeah. from a Western perspective. So, and I don't just mean Russia, Russia, but I also mean the countries surrounding Russia and into the yep. Middle East. Um, so the ex-Soviet Union, let's say, you know, that kind of region has very different standards. If you look at Georgia, for instance, 
in Georgia, they're supported hugely. If you're if you're a chess player, you know the government loves you, and it's like a really uh, big thing. So if you're in if you're in the UK, if you're in U- Europe, if you're in the U- USA or L- Latin America, whatever it is, you know you're not going to get any government support mm. at all. So you have to think, okay, if I'm going to be a professional chess player, uh, you know, am I going to be in the top hundred chess players in the world? Probably not. And even they struggle for money. Mm. So you have to either teach chess you know sell chess courses you know run your own chess company or become a content creator so Mm. increasingly there's this huge pressure for you know we said about like maybe 10 percent of the world or more playing chess right so you think that's a huge population and you've got that immense pressure because that's for they want supply right they want content so they're demanding 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 and then you have a very very small group of people who are able to answer the call and become a content creator and I'd say just one point, if you're out there and you're considering becoming a content creator, you should really think about what's the ratio of supply and demand in your sphere, right? Because it, it could be the case you're entering a really saturated content right. creation market where you're not able to find a position versus one that's like completely undersaturated and you've got billions of people uh, that really want something, but they're not getting their fix. Right. So um, yeah, I'd say that the chess is an interesting one. And there's a huge pressure to be a content creator, and especially with um, companies becoming more mechanized and stuff like that. There's less of a role for the individual to play in mechanical process. So it becomes more about like posing, you know what I mean? Like making videos and like, hey, I'm cool, you know, I'm playing chess yeah, and, yeah. and entertaining people. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. So in in chess, are there like, what do you think are the the parts of the ecosystem that are maybe oversaturated versus like the the blue ocean areas um and how do you think that that has changed over time that's a great question that's a really great question and like it it is a that's the big question that every content creator has to ask has to ask themselves right like right. where is that freedom what is my know? niche yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and and it's weird because you want the freedom like talking about you know things that you you do versus you don't do, you know, you want a a niche where you can do something today and you have something to do tomorrow, right? So you have the possibility to expand. There's no use like jumping in a niche and then just being like shoehorned into that corner. So many people get like typecast, you know, it's just like that one guy or the one girl that just does one really, really specific thing. And content creators don't want this, but then to be successful, they also want to expand, right? So it's like a... It's a really um, difficult one. In, in chess specifically, I'd say that it's changed over time. So it, I, I entered the chess industry maybe five, five six years ago. And back then, there's sort of this rising trend of Twitch streaming, right? And that mm. was definitely the freedom that people wanted. I say now it's not because people, are, yep. the content creators are realizing, okay, it's actually better to make YouTube videos because I get paid while I sleep. You know, it's like a completely different <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, perspective. <laughs> So, That's a really good know. way to put it, by the way, uh, about the difference between uh, streaming on Twitch and posting YouTube videos is that you get paid while you sleep. <laughs> yes. And I have to give a sh- I, like I, I'm not being paid to say this, but powder is incredible. And I love that tech <laughs> because it's like it, it is it is the ability like it, if you're a streamer out there and you're wondering, OK, how do I actually monetize like on a greater level and how do I make sure that people are finding me even when I'm at a restaurant, you know, or I'm taking a dump, right? I'm sleeping or whatever. Like, how do you make sure that you're still spreading out there and you're still getting exposure? And a hundred percent is for short form media because you, you think about, you know, we're talking about like an individual being a body, right? Or a company being a body. If you consider like reels and short form content, especially the stuff that Powder is producing, that's like the exterior hooks, right? But you kind of like get yourself totally. in and you drag in the audience into your heart. So it's sort of like this process so you can, you know, you have to, these days, if you're a content creator, you have to be doing long form content and short form content, ideally, so that you have a full package. And this is a lot of work. And if you can introduce AI, like Powdered, in order to, or, or alternatives, you know, it's not just clip making, you can use AI everywhere, like in script making and stuff like this. It really lowers the, the amount of hours you need to produce. And I tell you, like, as a video editor, we've got the start in this industry by video editing. It is laborious video editing and especially reels. It can take so much time. Yeah. It, and so much of it, I mean, of course, like there's the fun parts. There's like, how do I make the cool transition? Like, how do I make this really funny? How do I make like, you know, each beat land, right? 
Um, but then there's like the really tedious parts, which is like, and I'm rewatching it for the 40th time to make <laughs> sure that like it, this transition like, you know, works where I want it to. And then I'm like moving the little trimmer, like just a tiny bit. Um, so I hear you. That's um, so true. Have you, so you've done lots of real making yourself. You've been through the I, process. And... I have. I did a weird thing last year where um, I challenged myself to post a video on TikTok every day. Um, mm. And I'm not a video, I'm not, you know, natively a video editor or anything like that. And so uh, I learned really a lot, though, um, because when you have to post every single day, um, you get really efficient and you use all the right, you use all the tools to help uh, <laughs> simplify that process. And you also start to understand the, the rhythm of a, a video for each platform and like the, the way that the videos you know, move and uh, how they land to an audience on Instagram Reels is totally different than how they land on, on TikTok or even Twitter or something like that. So um, it, it was definitely fascinating. And I have a ton of respect for professional video editors because that was not easy. It's so true. If you're a CEO or you're, or you're anyone out there looking to hire someone, make sure that your key positions, right, such as head, head of marketing, you know, or anything related to creative activity, but your the people you hire actually have experience in producing content, you know, and totally. ideally, like, you know, there's this new role coming out, that's like the chief influencer role, you know, it's like, you know, some some startups are starting. And I think it makes so much sense, because you need someone who's able to get their hands dirty and get on the ground mm. and understand what it's like. And especially if you're in uh, video games, right, it's like, there's nothing more creator hates, like working with a company that actually isn't involved in the market, they want people who are been there for totally. years you know like like know what's going on like because yeah. the, you know businesses we, we have this idea that like everything has to generate profit right and we we've got this very uh formulative idea especially driven by investors and capital but the creators quite often the reason why these people are streamers and i this is no insult to, to streamers right yeah, but yeah it's the case that they don't have a degree you know they don't have any kind of formal education and if they do they've abandoned it um so that for, for whatever reason they're, they're streaming to, to millions of people, you know, we, we can't insult them for that. We don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. We just know yeah. it's huge influence and you have to think in terms of, you know, on their terms when you speak to them. So yeah, really great that you're able to do that. It's like, um, you, yeah, so you've done it, a different it, one every day, like a different yeah. reel. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think with any kind of uh, social platform, especially it, each one has its own language. And you need to develop like a level of fluency in order to, you know, feel yeah. like you're, uh, you understand the language of the in-group. It reminds me of, did you, did you see Mean Girls back in the day? Sorry to like, date I, I myself did. with I've this millennial reference. Um, yeah. The, uh, you know how there's like Amy Poehler's character. It's like, I, I'm not a regular mom. I'm a cool mom. And it's like so obvious that she's not part of the group, <laughs> you know, because yeah. of the, the way she's dressed and the way she's talking and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I find that it's, it's kind of like that when a, when a senior executive is like talking about TikTok, but it's very clear they've like never downloaded the app and spent time training the algorithm to themselves. Um, it, it's, not, it's not like a dirty lowbrow thing to do to enjoy social media the way that millions and millions of people do. It's like a kind of a necessity in order to understand like what is going on there. It's so true. It reminds me of like a relay race, right? So like for so long in, in marketing, you've got like a, you know, CMO or whatever running with like a baton, you know, so I'm going to hold this for 25 years, right? And then I'm going to retire because my information <laughs> yeah. will be outdated, you know, and he passed it to the next guy and he only holds it for 10 years, right? And he's like, what the hell? Like this is not working anymore. And it's got to the point where now like you, your career as a marketer, a marketeer, if you figure out the market, even in the first place, you're only going to hold it for like six months, you know, and then your entire <laughs> ideology has to be like wiped out and replaced. So like in, in, I tell you what, like if you're a, if you're a, 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 an executive in a company and you're dealing with these things, you have to speak to children, you know, you have to go there and find nine year olds and be like, kid, tell me what's going to happen next. You know, because <laughs> yeah. like, how do you talk to your friends? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, we're all so out of date. And I'm 26 years old, almost 27. And I tell you, like, I, I rely on like 22 year olds helping me out. And you think that's not much of a difference, right, between a 22 year old and a 20 generationally very different, it, completely different, it's yes. like a different species, right? Yeah. So like, uh, 
Yeah. So, and it, I tell you the skill, like if you can develop the skill, especially if you're working with content creators, it's all about bridging the gaps between people. If you can transmit the message from a C-level executive, that everyone thinks is out of touch, you know, and then take his message, reform it in the production, you know, and, and sell it to your influencer mm. who's like a 15 year old kid. So he's able to understand and then take the results and go back and report on it in a way that you're translating. You can actually make two people very, very happy, even though they've never met each other and could never communicate properly, you know. So, so interesting. Yeah, yeah you're right. You a lot of, I guess a lot, that is a lot of the work of like an influencer manager is kind of code switching between these two seemingly very different groups who actually care about the same thing, which is like making the audience happy uh, and growing the channel, right? <laughs> like those are the things that kind of everyone wants. Um, but if you can't communicate to each other, because you just speak a different language, right? Like one person speaks in ROI and another person speaks in like, um, you know, likes, shares, general yeah. engagement and, uh, you know, just time spent with your, your community. It's such a weird thing. You know, my girlfriend's a content creator, right? Mm. And she'll go to like a party or something and, you know, she'll get like an average amount of, in, of like uh, attention, right? And then she then she'll be like, oh no, I have like, you know, X million followers or something. And everyone in the room's like, followers, followers, followers. And like this word <laughs> like echoes and suddenly everyone's like, wow, wow. Like, so but, like you know, this is really- turn, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's almost like, oh yeah, I have 1 million followers. I mean, if I said like on LinkedIn, like nobody would care. But if you say like TikTok, it's like, whoa, that's so cool. Like, so it, so it really funny. matters like what context your followers are, like where they are, yeah. and what it is. But it's it's a weird one because, you know, influencers, it's, it, they kind of feel that the whole world is revolving around them to some degree. And in, in some ways it is, right? Like a niche can revolve around one character, you know, right. that has to translate like into your real life. And you have to make these two things make sense. And it's really hard for creators. And as a, a manager of creators, you have to understand where that gap is, you know, where, where mm. are you dealing with Magnus Carlsen, the legend, you know, the greatest chess player of all time. And then when are you dealing with just Magnus, you know, just your friend or whatever, or like some guy, and right? Like, how do you, na how um, do you navigate that? And how do you kind of parse the difference between those two, the public and the private persona? Yes. Yeah, so it, it, it really, you have to understand both personas really well. You know, you have to understand the front end and the back end of, a, of the person, um, person's perception and their public appearance. And you have to know like where the transition points are. So if the person might be very aggressive in their real life, let's say, you know, and then mm. they get on camera and that translates to passion. So there's lots of movement, there's lots of energy. So you understand if you kill their aggression behind the scenes, you're actually going to damage their passion on the screen. So, right. uh, and people end up sacrificing their own personal life for their on-screen appearance, right? So they're like, typical one is like Hollywood alcoholics, right? Like you know, yeah. dr drug addicts and stuff. And this stuff is so real and it's not the kind of stuff that you you generally, you're not gonna get in a textbook, right? You're not gonna get this stuff in a university. And, but it's, it's the most key to, to understanding how to work with people is you have to get to the real human nitty gritty instincts and realize like where those transition points, where are they motivated? And then finally, you have to very, very carefully understand which way do you have to change their back personality? Like how do you talk to them as an individual and how that reflects on screen? You know, this right. is the typical thing as like a director, right? Like how do you, how do you do that? And this is for video production, is for, for marketing, is for any appearance they might make. It's also products, right? So you don't want, if you're managing someone, you don't want to push them into a book deal if you know that they're not the kind of person that's going to sit down and and, and read a book and write a book know, write yeah a, and write a book <laughs> yeah. yeah and write a book uh you know so yeah it's this um really detailed understanding of people um and there's part of you that has to be a somewhat of a fly on the wall um you can't engage with talent in a way that you would with your friend um mm. to some degree because you have to be kind of trying to discover who they are you know and it, the more you can discover who they are and what they want to do the more you can help them and it requires trust from a talent to be able to trust you either as a creative director or manager. How has kind of chess streaming and the content creation around chess changed? And what kinds of specific examples can you give as to the way that the, the video has changed or audience interaction has changed or the chess player maybe like annotating or giving details or something has changed? Yes. Yeah, good question. I mean, it's changed massively because 
chess fundamentally has been quite like a boring game to most of the world, right? For majority of history. And chess has been around for like 3000 years. So, um, yeah, before Jesus, it was like, uh, don't quote me on that. Like you have to check online, but it's something ridiculous, like 2000, 3000 years. Like it's really, really old. So you think like, okay, how are you going to revolutionize like the perspective on that? Right? Like, as a viewer sport, like, what is this? And when I first went into the industry, it was like, you know, two Russian guys sitting down, there's a chess board and they're going, oh, you know, this should be five. Blah, blah, blah. And they kind of talk like this for like six or seven hours, everyone's yeah. sleeping. And it's like, okay, like whatever. And they shake hands at the end of the game and it's over. Right. So it's like, this is like not, not very interesting, you know? And sure. then I became a bit of a chess nerd. Right. And I got into studying all the moves and stuff and I was like, okay, this is pretty brilliant. But how do you translate the brilliance of the intellectual sport into something that the audience can actually understand that there's legitimate mm. drama happening, you know? So the perspective is interesting at the start it was like you know can the tournament organizers afford cameras you know can they get the cameras in the right place you know can they get commentators um and then eventually you know we had two cameras so you can cut between one camera and another camera angle and then it was like okay we learned how to do interviews right so you interview the players after yeah and so gradually it changed um i'd say it hasn't got to the point where i wanted to be yet and I think that um, even with like, I'm not going to say any names in, individually, but there's certain people at the top, you know, Magnus's level, that would really love to see shorter time controls, right? Like chess being more faster pace, quicker mm. action, you know, one minute games, like fire, you know, crazy camera angles, you know, yeah. audiences roaring. Like, and I think the sport has that potential. We, we What we ended up doing is we added like um, heart rate monitors to the players, right? So you can see the, yeah. the heart rate of, of, of paces of the moves we had um we were measuring carbon dioxide levels in the air which was something else which we did oh wow like to, okay we had like an we had like an air air partner who was like um it's called air things it's like a partner that like okay. tests how i'm just plugging tons of people well it's like how, go, how stressed people are by by how hard they're exhaling during a match a little bit like that yeah yeah it was also like the more oxygen in the air the higher the performance like and but it's crazy. You can burn like 4,000 uh, calories a day just playing chess. Like, um, <laughs> like it's it, these guys have to eat so much, right? Like, and yeah. they have to train physically because you've got to sit there for like five hours or something just staring at a board. So your body has to be immensely prepared. Um, and your brain is just firing on all cylinders. So, yeah. you know, it, but that's often not seen like by the audience. So, you know, heart rate, um, oxygen, br- breathing, new camera angles, chess becoming online is a really yeah. big thing as well. Um, so yeah, all these things go into new perspectives of trying to rehash and reinvent a sport that we've all loved for, for so long. I have maybe a couple more questions for you. Yeah. The first one is, what advice would you give to individuals aspiring to become influencers? I would say be very, very careful. That's why I say like, okay. because, because it's the new thing, right? Like, you know, you have to realize like, since the beginning of time, there's certain archetypes, right? There's a king, there's a warrior, there's a farmer, where everyone has these things. And this new, like, influencer archetype is, it, you know, we like to think of this as something new, um, but in many ways, it's just kind of a birth of something old, whereas it's, it's kind of like a recreation of things. So in some ways, you could view this as like a competing um a competing thing for like even being a nobleman or being like mm. a king or a queen in some ways you're trying to win the hearts of the people you know or you could also say just a performer or a jester you know and what's the difference between a king and a jester right it's like you get to this point where it's very hard to even understand you know like what you're aiming at so if you're aspiring to be a content creator be really honest with yourself of what you're doing is something that's a bubble you know it might not last forever uh, this yeah. is a, something that's working for now. Um, we don't know if it's always going to work. Um, and I'd certainly say you need to speak to other content creators and you need to have a really honest look at your life. You know, I I, I, I used to work in a supermarket, right? That was uh, my job, yeah. right? I just stack, stack the shelves, right? Before I'd done anything content creation, that was my job. So I had this dilemma where I was like, okay, do I become an influencer manager, like um, a video editor, or do I become a manager of my store, right? Like, which yep. which is my career direction, right? And I was in this situation where I was like, okay, like, what the hell is this situation? They're like, so weird. You know, need, 
neither of them are like that impressive although to be honest like store managers really matter right we need to eat food yeah, so it's like that's really important but at the time this was my life situation and i decided to like try do both and i think that this mm. is the the best thing you know if you can create content in like four or five hours in a day and then the other half you can do four or five hours work in a real job and then like balance these then you can get to the point where you're like okay like I'm able to have my career in the real world and then I'm able to have my virtual experience that's very different. Um, but the, the key, the one piece of advice that I've had that I want to give from people who are really successful in content creation is they never really identify as an influencer. And this is something mm. that's like so key because, you know, Levy Rosman, right? Gotham Chess, yep. like he is such a good speaker and really good salesman. It's not what he's always doing, but he's very good at speaking to people. And I truly believe from the minute the Levy stepped in, in front of his camera and made his first video, he believed that he was speaking to a real room of real people and he was really yep. trying to make a connection. So, you know, he doesn't, I don't think he saw himself as like, oh, I'm becoming an influencer, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, you know, like he's just like, I've got my people, they're listening. I have information. I have chess courses. I'm a businessman and that's his identity. So, you, you have to realize that influencing is like the commonality between all the niches, but the individual people in the niches are actually doing real work to some degree. So Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I really warn anyone that just wants to get views to be very, very careful. Don't chase for views because like you're running circles. It's very dangerous. Yeah. And then on the flip side, what advice would you give to an agent or a marketer hoping to succeed with influencer strategies in chess or elsewhere? work for free that's what, that's what my advice is work for free okay. and and uh, but the reason why is that you don't you don't want to be paid to do these things and because it has to come from passion so in the same way that you shouldn't identify mm. as an influencer you shouldn't go out there thinking okay like this is my career i'm like an influencer manager you know because you get you get quite i think if there's there's some kind of fear of being arrogant in in it as well because you you're so close to people that get such tremendous attention and so if you go into his career and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm a manager of, of influential people, it's like you're going to fall flat on your face like as a manager because, <laughs> you know, you're just like, you know, I'm, I'm Hollywood, you know, and it's just like good luck. You know, it's, it's, you, I think you're going to fail. So I honestly, if you want to enter something like influencer management, you have to be a friend first, you know, and you have to be a fan first. Yeah. You have to be a content creator first. Like what you're saying, like if you go into a company like, oh, I'm a new CMO, I'm a big executive you know, you're going to fail. You've got to go in there, have that honesty of like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to pick up TikTok. I'm going to film every day and get nitty gritty down uh, into the real world. And that's the way you're going to succeed, succeed as a, as an influencer manager in terms of like how you're going to live off it or how you can make money. Typically, you know, by working for free, you gain so much experience that you're going to be able to get into those areas where you can find a way to be able to make mm. money and make it into a career. Um, but initially, I'd, yeah, I'd say find the passion, find the love. Don't be ingenuine. Don't work with creators that you don't like. You know, there's so many people that yeah, want to work with someone who's, yeah, like it's not going to work. Like, it, you know, there, there's some people that are really great, but you're just not the person to work with them. You know, you're just not going to get that match. So keep it personal, keep it real. Um, yeah, and don't chase for money. I'd say on all sides, never chase money. It's a, it's a, it's a delusion. You know, you've you got to chase value. You've got to help people. That's the goal. Tell me what's coming next for you. And then also tell me where people can find you and uh, the people you work with. Of course. Yeah. So I, I'm currently working at Mortal Game. There's a project which I'll, I'll talk about quickly. So you've got Chess.com, who I used to work with. And I, I love Chess.com. I have a very good career there and lo love all the people. Chess.com is, is kind of been the guardians of the chess world for a long time. I mean, you have Lee Chess. It's a fantastic site, mm. right? A free, free website. Um, it's been out there for, for quite a while. A mortal game, which I which I've been working with, is basically the next big thing, right? So that's what we're aiming yep. for. So we're aiming to disrupt this market of the two the two leaders and come in with a third alternative. So I, there's so much I I can say about Immortal. There's also things I can't say because we're working on some really cool projects. Um, but definitely check it out. Just go to immortal dot game, and then you can just check me out online. I'm usually called String Dog, um, okay. which is like like one Snoop G or Dog. two Gs. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, what one one G, um, but two Ds. No, no, two Gs on the second on the second word. Okay. So st string one G, then the dog with with, with double G. So uh, yeah, 
and I'm sure there's going to be some links so you can check them out. Um, but it's been really nice chatting, and this is yeah, topics it's been so great. Yeah, and if um, there's anyone listening out there that like to like any advice whatsoever, or if I can help you, don't be afraid to reach out, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. And that's our show. Thanks for tuning into Influence. It was really wonderful having Louis here. Our conversation spanned a lot of ground, especially about chess. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, either in audio form or in video form, so you never miss an episode. And follow us on social media at PowderGG on Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube for more updates and behind-the-scenes content. <laughs>